Hi, everybody. Before we get to another great interview, we could really use your help. IMDB, which is the entertainment database, recently named the Two Opinionated Podcast one of its top 100 podcasts. This is a monumental feat for this program. You know, we're a father and son team out of a small town in West Virginia, have been doing this for about five years. There's 15 million podcasts out there. About 40,000 of those get to the point that they're listed on IMDb. Out of those 40,000 out of the 15 million, we are ranked number 82. Something that we're just immensely proud of. We're so thankful for our listeners, our watchers, our fans. Thank you so, so much. If you would like to help us out and we're asking for it, please. Um, it's easy. It's real, it, it's really easy. It's free. If you go to IMDB, that's IMDB.com, look up two opinionated podcasts and just take a look at the page. That's all you have to do. I mean, you're welcome to look at the cast, look at the episodes so you can kind of see who's been on the program. Do whatever you want, but even just bringing up the page, imdb.com, Two Opinionated Podcast, bring up the page, look at it. That helps us so much. So please, if you can do anything, we would really appreciate that. Um, our YouTube channel is MeisterCon Pod. Love to have your subscription there. It's also free. And you can also check out our website, MeisterCon.com, where you'll find almost 700 episodes, audio and video, available on there. There's also a terrific blog from Brett, and it'll let you know anything that we have going on in studio, if we're covering a convention, if we're going on location, anything that we have going on will be on the website, MeisterCon.com. Thank you guys so, so much. We appreciate you so much much. I, I can't express enough how appreciative we are of all of you. We never, never expected to, to do as well as, as we have, and that's all because of you. Thank you so much. Enjoy that interview. Bye, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Two Opinionated. So excited today. I've got actor, writer, Dean Butler with me. So welcome, Dean. Hey, how are you? You know, I'm pretty good today. Good. I, I love it when I get stars from when I was growing up because everybody, like my parents, that's the only that's the only people they care about. Yeah, right. none of today stuff. I I tried for for years to get them to watch the uh, podcast, and they say we talk to you every day. <laughs> we what do we need to watch for? We talk to you every day. But yeah. then when I get somebody, you know, from back in the day on. Then they're like, well, maybe we'll watch. So I, no, so I okay. told them you were coming on. They're they're going to watch this one. So. Okay, well, that's cool. Now, before okay. we get started, Michael, you need to tell me what the title of you, you know, I'm always curious about, you know, because I'm well, doing I told a you lot I'd of let shows you know. these days. What does too opinionated mean in your title? What is that about? Well, okay. So, so my son and I started this podcast and the okay. original idea was that we would have generational differences, you okay. know? And, and so we would be too opinionated about our opinions. And we would we would argue about uh, whatever nerdy stuff we were interested in. But how old's your, how old's your son? Well, so he's 24. He's a, uh, okay. his full-time job is he's a children's librarian. Okay. So then he, he podcasts on the side. You know, okay. This is my main gig. But this wow. is his, his side gig. So, but All right. so two things happened when we started. One, he figured out very quickly he doesn't like being on camera. That's not for him. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> he prefers the behind the scenes stuff, the editing, that type of stuff. So that was okay. one. the other okay. one was we had strong opinions, but they were the same. We didn't have differing opinions. So there was well, that's not so effective then for the not yeah. very effective. So, so just too opinionated in one direction. One so direction. you're sort of preaching to the choir all That's the it. time. That's it. Yeah. So, yeah. but you know how that goes. We had the name out there then. So sure. we're like, okay, sure. too sure. opinionated. That's the name. But then we we pivoted to uh, the interview 
uh, yeah. uh, situation, which is when it took off. You know, it took off for us. So when we okay, did. so does he your son more, edit the your son edits the program? Is that what he happened? does? All the editing, does the marketing, okay. the hard stuff. I'm just, I'm just yeah, right. You just do the talking. Yeah. Right. Okay. I show up and and talk and then leave all the stuff to him. Sure. No, that makes <laughs> sense. Good for you. You've got the you've got the the more relaxed side of the gig. I mean, I know it, it's as long I as the conversation like, flows, it's it's going to be it's easy for you. That's it. I, I think I got the better end of it. Yeah. Yeah. But now he would yeah. disagree. Okay. Well, you that know, and isn't that perfect though? Yeah. So then now now it's really working. Everyone's getting what they want. Well, that's it. The only yeah. time he complains is if I try to give him too many to edit in one week, which I will do. You know, I'm of yeah. that opinion. It's like, nobody wants to wait months to get their interview out. Yeah. You know, we got to, we got to turn them around, you know, two weeks max. Got to turn those. Yeah. Around. Cause yeah. I mean, I've done, I did an interview back in January, you know, that so I had someone interview me. It still hasn't come out. Yeah. Well, like, that's, that's too long. Yeah. That, that is too long. Yeah, you know, in the in the uh, in the pro world, in the serious pro world, things are turned around within hours, and uh, if not minutes, Bam. sometimes it's it's really really fast. But that you know that's that's uh, pressure on a whole different level, uh, where you're chasing where you're chasing news cycles, and you, you've well, got to right. have it right now. That's right. Yeah. And and we that uh, that two week and most of the time it's a little quicker than that, but that's that's pretty effective for us because we can only put out yeah. one a day, you know. Otherwise, yeah. you're doing a disservice to the sure. people you're interviewing. Sure. Well, all right. So here we are, Michael. Let's here we are. You know, let's 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 get into this so your so your son can edit it and pull <laughs> it together. He's already going. I'm going to have to edit all of this. <laughs> <laughs> This whole this whole first five minutes is gone. <laughs> this all of it gone. All right, all right. So if you need to start it again, then start it again. No, 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 no. Okay, no. That's a on being honest. This show took off for us as soon as we stopped worrying about it. You know, we just we're like, if we screw up, we're just gonna we're gonna put it out there. Hey, we messed this up, but we're gonna learn from it so we don't do it again. Yeah, that, right. That no, I, I look, I, and I think that's a part of the. I think that's a part of the appeal of the whole podcast world is that it's very spontaneous. It's perhaps a little underproduced, but it feels authentic. And I, and I think that's a big part of why these people like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So so let's start, let's start this way, sir. Cause we got a lot to cover, but let's start. I always love to hear how somebody got started. So what got you into the entertainment business? That's a difficult business to get into, whether you got into it today or, you know, years ago. Sure. You know, I think on the on the on the macro level, if you're looking at sort of the the big the big thing, I think for me, Michael, it was about the need to be seen and heard. You yeah. know, I, I think as a young person, everyone wants to find that place where they can make a difference, where their peers look at them and say, "Oh, they're good at this." <laughs> You know, I mean, it's like if you're, you know, if you're star of the football team, that's big currency in high school. You that's know, not- if you're an athlete, that's big currency when you're young. It becomes a little more diversified as we get older. Yeah. But nonetheless, if you're not, if you're not rising to that level as a kid, then you need to find if you're not the athlete as a kid, you've got to find someplace, someplace else to shine. And for me it became about talking was the, was the thing that ultimately um, ultimately got me some currency with my peers. And then once I was talking and being appreciated for that, then, (laughs) then it was um, then it was about being seen too. And that led me to the stage as a, you know, as a, as a sophomore junior in high school, stepping onto the stage and having the lights and the, you know, the lights and the, the audience and the, the applause. And, you know, there's some people who really uh, thrive in that. And there are other people who shrink in that space. And I, I found really quickly that there was a ham in me that really sort of opened up and became uh you know i i got what i was looking for there and i was acknowledged for it 
by my peers, which was, I can't, I can't uh, overstate how important that is. Yeah. And I think we all need that. No matter what we do, we, we all want that affirmation, particularly from the That's people right. we grow up with, yeah. you know, who have seen us. Like I went to school, I grew up in a small town in, in Northern California, uh, in a small little community. I went, to, I graduated high school with largely the same group of people I started kindergarten with. Yep. You know, so we saw each other through a lot of stuff. Uh, a lot of the, you know, those early growing pains and then that sort of adolescence and coming of age and girlfriends and, you know, all those things going, applying to college and going off to college. We saw each other through all that stuff. And so, you, you know, we all, not we all, cause we all didn't, but those who found their space, it was, it was really important. And I think for those people to whom that is important, that becomes this urgent thing and you've got yeah. to find your space. So for me to come all the way around your question, what got me started yeah. need to be seen and heard. It was a big, big deal to me. I love that because I don't think anybody's ever given me that answer. The, the mm -hmm. majority of the time, the answer I get is, well, I, you know, I, I came out of the womb acting, you know, mm. I was, I was a cut up right from the beginning you oh know, wow! And that's the yeah, that was definitely not me. Yeah, yeah I, I I, my that. the first time I was in a play, Michael, I had three lines and forgot two of them in the play. <laughs> I mean, it, it was it was a very I was a very shy, nervous, insecure kid. Me so too. yeah, I I think a lot of people who identify comedically, yeah, that muscle is working very early on and i always think that must that comedic muscle the people who are cut ups there's there's a motor behind that which isn't necessarily so funny right. but there's a there's a need to find the funny because that sort of takes the pressure off but there's a i think there's for years being around comedians i felt boy there's a lot of darkness in funny there is you're right you know it, it's and it's interesting that people and we see this on sort of on the large level of uh the entertainment industry people who are sometimes you know in very gifted comedically are also wonderful dramatic actors too yeah. because they they really feel profoundly and they're they are very much observers and there is a deep well of of feeling in those people and that is driving that comedy you know the person i think of the most when i think of that is the late robin williams who was so amazing as a comedic presence i mean no one had ever seen anything like that when That's he exploded right. on the scene and then when he first then when he started to appear in films playing he did obviously comedies initially but when he started to appear dramatically it was just a shock no one That's thought right. he had that but he had it huge and it was very powerful very moving very authentic um he was a surprisingly strong no, no, he was, actor yeah. i yes, mean, he was I mean everybody was used to him being actor. funny but he yeah. was a really good actor yes he was Yes, he was. And, and I think that's where, you know, that's where I really started with him specifically is where I really started to think about this contrast between, between funny and serious, you know, someone else who of an older generation, Don Rickles was a very funny, Rickles. broadly funny guy, also a pretty terrific, serious, dramatic yeah. actor too. He could do that. That's not what his stock and trade was. That's right. not how he was. <laughs> most rewarded but he had all that yeah. and he could bring it when when asked for I, I think people probably when he did bring it were probably you know look at waiting for the punchline to come just yeah. because that's you know that's who he was right. but um no it is interesting how um how funny people uh, there's a lot more in funny than just funny well there's such a rhythm to comedy I don't know yes, if that helps is. with the dramatic side, but I'm guessing it does. I think it's all, I mean, I think, yes, I agree with you. Comedy is about rhythm and timing and, 
you come to understand where the jokes live right. in so, the way someone's comedy works. You yeah. just sort of know what's what's coming. Interestingly, someone like, I mean, okay, talking about Don Rickles, who was very much a sarcastic one-liner, <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And then you have someone his, who was historically funny, like a Mark Twain, who didn't right. tell jokes per se, he told wonderful stories yeah. with a lot of intention in the stories. And he was a great commentator, but it, it, every line wasn't funny. But when he got to the end, it was funny. You're right. And, you know, so a different, a different kind of a, a different kind of a vibe. I always thought he'd make a good baseball uh, broadcaster. Oh. oh, God, I would think you're right. I mean, the, these baseball is about. Yeah, baseball is about telling a, a long, slow story. Right. Or, you know, a gentle story about a game. Uh, well, the great, I, you know, living in Los Angeles for years, the great Vin Scully was a wonderful, Scully. wonderful storyteller and it could establish, uh, could establish an atmosphere and a feeling about a, a, a space. Yeah. And he could, he spoke poetically about it. He really game. did. Yeah, no, it was beautiful but to listen to him call a game. And there were obviously many others, but he is the one I was most, I became most aware of at a certain point in my life. And there was poetry in Vince Scully. Yeah. yeah. It was probably uh, Marty Brenneman for me. I was a Reds fan. Okay. So him and Joe Nuxall when I was growing up, you know, I'd listen on the radio, you know, going to sleep at night. And uh, yeah, it's a, uh, uh, it's difficult, like today, it's difficult to explain to someone that didn't have all the electronics just how important those radio broadcasts of ball games were. I used to love listening to those. Oh, yeah. Well, you could lose yourself in that. And for a generation, certain generation of people, and we're sort of on the, you know, we're in a bridge. I mean, right. I, uh, Michael, I'm 68. I just turned 68. How old are you? I'm 54. Okay, so yeah, so we're we're in this bridge between the audible medium yeah. of of entertainment. We're more visual than, but there was a lot of appreciation for uh, certainly for sports broadcasting uh, as we grew up, and some great great voices. Oh my gosh, and great storytellers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. so we got we got to talk about the 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 book, but but before we do that, okay, I just want to mention. Because because yeah. I part of the reason I, I love the 70s and 80s is I was such a, a, a fan of, of TV, cinema, all that stuff. And and I love mm -hmm. the connections. You know, I was a big reader back then, too. Mm -hmm. And I, I mm -hmm. remember being around that teenage age, so 11, 12, 13 years old. And we would sneak to go read forever from Judy oh, Blue. Wow. wow. You know, that was, that was very risky. That was, fun. yeah, that would have been a risque. Risque read for that. Yeah, but, but, you know, one, Somebody in the group got a hold of one and we passed that thing around. And then, and then of course you, you start in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there, there's another version of it that's being done now with an African-American couple and they're doing it that. as a, they're yeah. doing it as a series. So what we did for CBS was, you know, was the two hour, the two hour telling of this story and um <laughs> and it was what it was uh, wasn't it uh, stephanie zimbalist was uh, yes was awesome Ka stephanie zimbalist with cat was catherine danzinger yeah. and um stephanie was so interesting about stephanie because stephanie she was perfect for this and the reason she was perfect beca is because stephanie is a is is a very real person um, there was, you know, when you think about this, what it could be, if you cast this with someone who was overtly sexual in the way that they presented a young woman who was overtly sexual, it's a very different story then. It is. Yeah. Stephanie was, is a sort of a classic beauty, understated, very, you know, just sort of scrubbed clean, pure kind of a presence that she has. And so- she came you across always, very proper in most of her roles. No question. No yeah. question. And I think she radiates dignity. Yeah. She she radiates a, a kind of, a, you know, a, an inner 
confidence, a very strong moral core. So for, for Stephanie to play this part of a young woman discovering herself, discovering right. her sexuality, making those decisions, you know, those are another kind of young woman might have come off very differently in that. Stephanie was very thoughtful about it because Stephanie's thoughtful about everything. It's just right. who she is. So that made it that made it interesting. And then casting me at that point, I mean, I think what I radiated was a kind of a thoughtful, decency, good guy, um, responsible, you know, so it was too, listen, everybody goes through this. Everybody falls in love for the first time. Right. Everybody has that moment when they're going to make a big decision. And, um, and I think it was very important to John Cordy, who was the director of this, to have two people. And I think it was in, it was definitely uh, deep, deeply embedded into the way Judy Bloom wrote the novel. These were not, these were not two racy kids. These were two decent kids right. who were yeah, making a very kids. big decision. Yeah. 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 It always had a, a, you know, the, the impact it had on me changed as I got older, but, uh, but I just, so how did it, how did it change? I mean, how, how did that, how did that change? What did you, what was sort of racy in the beginning and then appreciated it a little bit more as I got, okay. got yeah. on with yeah. that, you know, whereas when I was younger, I, I didn't read the whole book. I was just looking for certain parts. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I remember that when I first read The Godfather, the paperback, it was like page 26 when Sonny meets the, uh, you know, Sonny meets the bridesmaid. Yep. I mean, that was a, you know, that was a pretty hot scene. I, you know, when I got there, I thought, and I don't, I don't know how old I was. I was probably 14 when I read The Godfather for the first time. I was like, <laughs> wow, that's pretty hot. Yeah. And, uh, but that was, you sort of expected that to be hot right. with, with forever. The cool thing about it was almost any kid and most kids are, you know, they're always those kids who are this sort of ahead of the game right? with their peers and they're doing things that nobody else is doing. This, this Michael and Catherine story, Catherine Michael story was not about the kids who are out in front. They were two kids who were a little slower. I like that. Yeah, you know, they were a little more thoughtful, a little more reticent, but when they fell, they fell hard. Yeah. And um, and that made it, I think, very relatable to so many kids who were right there in that space of being just like, what is this amazing thing that is happening to me? And they they were I think that's they part were of the reason playing catch up all the time. Yeah, because it was it is it, it they were very relatable to a lot of us. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that Judy Bloom certainly wrote it that way. Yeah. That they were very relatable. And I and so I'm I feel very lucky that uh and fortunate that that Stephanie and I had the opportunity. We met doing this. I mean, you know, we've known each other for a long time because of this. Um and I, I think well, you know, look, we had we had a lot of fun making this but we also knew that we represented something that was very mainstream you know it was very much where most people lived in their yeah. in their development it's interesting that they're remaking that that's i'm i'm curious to see which where that shows up as a, as yeah i you know I'm, i feel like it's something like amazon prime or it's yeah, gonna yeah. be so there probably won't be a ton of restrictions on that oh no Oh no, I think it's going to be I think that will be a very Not going to have the network uh, restrictions. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, we were definitely right in the thick of the middle of that standards and practices, you know, over the airwaves kind of decisions that were made about what you could show and what you couldn't show, uh which I think also made it more you know, you wonder, I mean, do you have to see all the detail? Yeah. I don't know that we really need to see all the detail. I think yes, we, okay, and, we and want to. When you're younger, you you'd need... say yes, you want to. But yeah, you're yeah. right. You don't need to. But do you need to? Yeah, yeah I, I don't, don't know that you really need to. Yeah, yeah. So so a couple other ones uh, uh, before before we move on. Um, 
Hank Summers, obviously, such a huge Buffy fan. I I, I was late coming to it. Like I didn't start mm. watching it till it was a few seasons in, mm. and they were they were mm. already starting to show it in reruns. And, yeah. and I caught yeah. it and, and just absolutely yeah. loved it. And that's one that uh, I've got to share cool. with Brett. And and he loves it. That's one of his favorite uh, series. Well, yeah. it's such a smart show. You know, uh, Buffy was a very very smart show. And um, well, because it sh- it should have been ridiculous. Like, well, it like certainly work. the feature film was ridiculous. It was. It was. It was. You know, it, it was a it was a popcorn, really a popcorn movie, and very broad. And, and yeah, and, and that's the way the studio wanted that. When Joss Whedon had the chance to revisit this material. Yeah. He knew he wanted to do something a little bit more serious. It certainly had humor to it, but it was a it was a smart humor. It wasn't a silly humor. That's right. And, yeah. yeah, it wasn't slapstick. Not at all. Not at all. Not and, at all. Which the movie, I love the movie too, but for different reasons. <laughs> yeah. No. No. Yeah. No. Exactly. It was. It. Well, the way the way with Christy Swanson, the way it was cast, Buffy was Buffy. You know, I mean, you saw her and you said, okay, I get this girl's name, Buffy. Sarah Michelle Geller radiates intelligence. And, uh, and I mean, look, she's a, you know, she's a very attractive, it was then, still is, I haven't seen her in years, but I would, you know, was a very attractive young woman, but more in the Stephanie Zimbalist mold of being attractive. So for that person to be Buffy, right. <laughs> that was just sort of, that was sort of funny. You just wouldn't have, you wouldn't have thought that this person would be called Buffy uh, yeah. necessarily. Christy Swanson. Yeah. Buffy. Oh yeah. yeah Christy totally. Swanson. That was Buffy. <laughs> Buffy. Yeah. Yeah. But, but Sarah Michelle Geller was a different thing. There was just, there was much more intellectually on this going on with that person than was happening than what was asked of Christy Swanson playing Buffy in the feature film. Um, I, you know, I, I think I was one of the reasons and look, Buffy's dad wasn't around a lot in that. It was, it wasn't designed that way. It was That's designed. Right. Buffy was in a single parent household. Dad was not really a good guy. Part of the, you know, the challenges that the relationship was that he just wasn't really a good dad. I think that's part of why it was hired because I think the expectation was that I would be a really good dad. Yeah. So there's this, you know, there's this well, sort because of because we see you like in roles sort of a, and we're like, yeah, it's, he's, he's, he's a good guy, nice but guy. oh, he's not a good guy. Yeah. And I think that was sort of an interesting thing. I'm very grateful to get that opportunity to be someone who was maybe a, a little less than uh, the sort of the, the perfect human being or the ideal that I was known for because of Little House. And um, uh, so that was fun. You know, that was, that was a fun thing to be, although, you know, look, I, I did five or six of these things. They weren't, they were not a lot, but it was, I got a trading card out of it, Michael. I got a Buffy trading card. That's got all to you sign need. the trading. Yeah. I mean, what more? Oh, do you I've need? seen the card. Yeah. I've, I, yeah, I, I, I got a trading card. So I felt good about that. I did a, um, off subject but i did a interview with uh sam jones that, that played uh flash gordon sure and, and he did the entire interview standing up which i thought was hilarious but he was surrounded he was just just surrounded by boxes i mean just dozens of boxes and, and i asked him i was like sam are you are you moving and he's like no these are just my action figures <laughs> you mean like action figures of him yeah action figures of him it's just like flash Being gordon flash gordon yeah, that's pretty cool. I was yeah. like, that's that's pretty good. That's yeah, cool. yeah. No, I the you know two weeks ago I was in Pepin, Wisconsin, at uh, for a for a little house in the prairie event, and I was in their little museum, and I did a little social media video standing behind a doll of Almanzo Wilder. So this is you know Almanzo is a little boy, uh, so I you know this was this was sort of a cool thing to do, but no action figures. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, you know, fun to be an action figure. I mean, who gets to be an action figure? Not you know, very many. Very few people get that. Yeah. Well, that was yeah. pretty good. Yeah. They're pretty cool. A um, couple other quick ones I wanted to mention there. Uh, when in the eighties, when you were sick, stayed home from school, in oh, the morning, okay. they would show Love Boat and Fantasy Island back to back in reruns. Oh, so I got to be on. You saw me back to back on. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, certainly could have. I yeah. did. 
because they would yeah. they would do that's what they would do they would do like a theme oh a, a lot of their funny. ones would be the same actors the same actors on both. oh yeah so yeah. I, I remember yours when you yeah, came you were on both <laughs> yeah you know that the i mean aaron spelling as a producer owned prime time at abc during a period of time uh during that during a window in the 80s it was just an incredible powerhouse that he had starting with love boat and fantasy island hotel oh hotel you yeah know, obviously yeah being beverly hills 90210 you know later um what a prolific producer he was boy he had his finger on the pulse of what people wanted to watch yeah. his stuff was huge it was huge you mean you could everywhere you turned there was an Aaron spelling show he is really an incredible uh, powerhouse and he had great people working for him and they just churned these things out. It was, it was a remarkable period. I'm surprised we don't have a show now that is, is similar to like a love boat or fantasy Island, kind of the oh. star of the week type of show, you know? Yeah. I mean, I was thinking, you know, talking about longevity, you know, you look at the law and order franchise, oh that's an extreme, that's an extraordinary franchise yeah. of primetime entertainment. I have a hard time watching that because none of it, the, all the actors, it's not about character. They're all doing exposition. They're right. all, you don't really get to know them so much as they are the, you know, they are the storytellers leading us to the, through into the crime, the discovery of the crime and the solution, mm -hmm. but you don't really feel anything about them. I think that's why I'm not as big a fan as some people are of those type yeah. of shows, because I like the character development and they're really about the story. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, it ripped from the headlines, uh, ripped from the headlines stories. I mean, you, the success of that, the success of that franchise is obviously unassailable. It's an incredibly, successful oh, franchise people have loved it i mean what are we talking 30 years at of, least and well and it's it's the reason we've got so many other ones you know ncis yeah. and uh, all of that right. procedural CSI, you know, procedural right. shows yeah yeah i mean it's it's uh my wife loves law and order Catherine watches she can watch law and order <laughs> and she just said it's just like it just sort of flows at you and it's as much as some of the stuff that they're talking about some of the stories are you know pretty edgy but it's you're just getting this story and it, and it's you sort of know how you're the guys you know the bad guy's going to get it in the end yep. and you know that they're going to get it in the end and it's just how we this journey to get there and it's comfortable you know it it's, is it's i think that's why a lot of people thing like to it. watch comfortable yeah. well yeah, you yeah. know it's going to get resolved <laughs> yeah no absolutely you know with with little house it was there were moral lessons but there like law and order there's a lot of ambiguity in a law and order story That's because right. you know why did they do it what 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 are the flaws in the people with little house it was not about that it was about good and not good yeah uh and you people could model good behavior or bad behavior and you knew who you were rooting for and you knew who you were rooting against and it was or not necessarily rooting against but you knew who was going to get it in the end that's right that's right. with with little house and there was there was clarity in that and a lot of heart and warmth that went along with that that was that was really you know that people loved and then there's a reason that people have been watching it for 50 years well, that's right because because it's just it takes well, you on the, very the values comfortable journeys. still hold yeah. up yes they do you know yes, i mean some of it may be a little dated, but the values, uh, the story still holds well, up. Well, listen, Michael, it was old when it was new. It, you know, it was never, it was You're never right. in fashion. It was, you know, it was always another time. Uh, it was never cool, you know, although people, there there certainly were sort of cool moments. If you were, you know, if you were Nellie Olson, you, you know, you, you had a license to be as obnoxious as you could oh, possibly yeah. be. And she was wonderful in that. But the stories were, the storytelling was very simple and clear. Yeah. And I, I think that's what, why it resonates so nicely. And I think why it will continue to resonate because you're not having to sift through the, the sort of the, the ambiguities and the nuances of the values today and the sort of the, the excuses, the, all the sort of the things that cloud storytelling or make it maybe make it more nuanced 
but you're not having to deal with that with Little House. You you right. know what's good and you know what's not good. And I think kids get to watch it and they get to decide what kind of kid they want to be. Who are they in the like story? Yeah. And a parent can watch it and they can say to themselves, watching Michael and Karen as, as Pa and Ma, what kind of parent do I want to be? Yeah. And I, I think there's the kind of choices, the kind of parenting choices that they made, I think that's timeless stuff. Right. Yeah. Very aspirational, you know, ne not necessarily easy to be, but boy, if you could be that parent, I mean, there's a reason that both of them and there are other, you know, the Waltons had this too. Of course. Yeah. There's a reason that people look at those at, at Michael and Karen and say, these, these are the, this is the mother and father I wish I had. Well, I no, think it's unfair to yeah. put that because everyone's, yeah. you know, parents have different kinds of struggles. They were there to be archetypal figures, right. but nonetheless, you get this, you know, you get what you get these wonderful lessons about the possibility of being the wonderful parent that, um, and the flawed parent too, but you saw them both make mistakes, but they owned up to those mistakes. Right. They saw the error in their ways and they apologized or, and you knew that they learned something from it and this was this was really important with little house is that there were lessons learned that could be shared and for michael it was really important to him that people could sit and talk about what they were watching or what they had a family watched. show yeah he really wanted that that was important to him today you know you can have five people in a room and we can all have our screens up to our faces we could all be watching five different things and the tv's on too and you know what what's the experience with it in the time that we were making this, it was really this wonderful shared experience generationally. And I think there was, that was a nice thing. It was, the, it was the, it was the, it was the operative way of delivering that kind of story. But I think it, along with being operative, it was a really wonderful way to engage people of different ages in conversation about yes. uh, that, where you could learn something from it harder today when everybody's watching something different. Well, yeah, there's uh, so much now uh, yeah. with that. But back then, you know, that was, it was, you, you hear people talk about appointment TV. It was appointment TV. I mean, families yeah, yeah. got together to watch. Yeah. And then you had a week to discuss that episode till the next one comes out. Yeah, right. No, exactly. I mean, we, you know, we had audiences of 20 plus million people That's a week <laughs> watching. You know, no, you nobody in like prime time has those kinds of audiences anymore. And, and there's no... There's no, there's not an expect, I mean, look, everyone would love to get those audiences, but you just can't get those audiences there. The pie has been cut up so finely that, you know, everyone is in this little niche of what they're doing, but we had to appeal television then had to appeal to a broad base of people. You right. weren't going to appeal to everybody. You know, Michael knew that little house wasn't for everyone. He knew that there was a group of people that had n no interest in what he was doing, but he also knew that there was a huge group of people out there that loved what he was doing. And so he was, he was very much supported in the kind of storytelling that he was doing. And all of us who were there with him got, a, got to be a part of that, which was a, which was really a wonderful gift. I mean, he was the reason that, that I started watching the little house to begin with, because I loved little Joe. Of course. You know, of course. Yeah, no, Michael was an icon by the time he, yeah. Yeah. He was I mean, a course, once I started watching, I had all kinds of reasons to keep watching, but he initially yeah. it was yes. him. And and the, the big thing I remember about Little House is we got cable TV in 1978. And I remember Little House was one of the first shows I watched after mm -hmm. we got cable, and the picture was so much better. Oh so sure. I remember it from that, sure. you know, because sure. used to that you know, three channels or maybe four with the extra dial, you know, yeah, with, <laughs> the reception with, wasn't with, great. With 420 lines, 480 lines of resolution in the screen, even the best television, if you compare it to the most minimal television today, it's not the, close. It's not even close. It's no. just, it's really remarkably different. And when the show was restored uh, in 2014 for the 40th anniversary by Lionsgate, they went. They went and took the picture through a whole upresing process and a re and a recoloring process that really makes the show now more beautiful than it was when it was yeah. new. 
they went back to the film and they ingested the film and they color corrected the film for today's monitors. Wow. You know, it just, it, it's just gorgeous. Have you rewatched it in the, in the better quality? I've watched, I've watched some of it. I haven't watched all of it. I, you know, during the pandemic, I know that, you know, people were stuck at home and people rediscovered little house again in a serious way and would sit and watch episode after episode after episode, because it just, they needed, you know, we had, they, um, we had Allison on, uh, around 2020, maybe 2021. Sure. She yeah. talked about that, just how, how much fun she was having because people were rediscovering or discovering it for new. Yeah. And it was oh, kind yeah. of surging back uh, yeah. because a lot yeah. of us had time on our hands that we weren't expecting. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It, you know, it was, I was still working in the early part of the pandemic. I was still working pretty diligently uh, for at NBC sports at that point. But um, yeah, I think there was a lot of, well, people needed comfort. That's one of the wonderful things about little houses. It's a comfort experience it's yes. a it's that safe place everything may be going completely bananas around you but in the world of little house in walnut grove things are understandable and a, the, the solutions are simpler and clearer and it and it it's a nice resetting of the world i know? like that yeah i think i, th yeah. I think that's it yeah it's a a more uh uh, a time that that a lot of us would would like to get back to i think yeah i think look i don't think there was anything simple about living in that time i mean i know but and it that was a hard life now the way it was presented on television it had this very idyllic quality to it obviously you'd want that um but while not an easy time to live in i i would not trade the time we live in for that yeah. time <laughs> just for this the basic conveniences yeah. that we have that they did not have now you know what they had or what we had making the program was a way of making that simplicity so beautiful yes. you know, it was beautifully photographed and beautiful lamplight and you know I idyllic settings with beautiful grass and you know and gorgeous trees and the perfect angles to I mean, that's the magic of film yeah. and television is you you get to shape that reality. But it, it was a lovely aspirational thing when you compare it to walking out into a gritty urban environment where things are dirty and it's loud and sirens and, you know, <laughs> all the things that you hear. Little House was all, you know, you heard the crickets at night and the breeze blowing through the grass. And those were the sounds of, you know, it was and and david rose's beautiful music that informed the audience emotionally about well, it was the space that they were in it was yeah. you know it was a, it's beautiful it's totally beautiful so so you've got the the new book coming out is is prairie yeah. man yeah my little house life and beyond which prairie man to me sounds like uh like an off-brand superhero <laughs> well then maybe then then good I, no one's put it that way to me, but I like that, Michael. <laughs> I, I like being an off-brand superhero. I'm not sure what his, what his powers would be, but... Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, you know, the power to plow, the, you know... <laughs> you know, the, the power to make... The storm, you know, with yeah, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the... Yes, exactly. I mean, the power to survive. Um, the, you know, that's... I think people love that about what we did. You know, I, I used Prairie in the title because... All of our cast, and it's so many women in our cast, I mean, yeah. Melissa and Allison, Karen, Ketty Lester, Charlotte Stewart, mm -hmm. now even two of the young girls, uh, Wendy Lou Lee, who was Baby Grace, and Jennifer Dunati, who played young Baby Rose. They've all written books. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, just that'll thought, tell you what an impact that show had. Everybody on the show has written a book about it. That's how impactful yeah, it was. And there, that, I mean, it's, it's certainly the books that we've written because the show has such an indelible quality to it there you know clearly you want to focus in on that area and and thematically build it around that idea um you know everyone's books cover other topics but there's something we know we've all known that because little house is as loved as it is i mean really deeply loved and appreciated that there's a there is 
very important value in stepping into that world and talking right. about that world uh, for all of us. And and I think we all look. While it wasn't necessarily always perfect every minute, and what is perfect every minute? There is nothing perfect every minute. But when I when when I personally, and I think all of us do this, when we look back at this beautiful program having this 50 this year this beautiful 50 year anniversary which is a very special That's anniversary right. to have culturally half a century is a big yep. deal um we're not alone there there certainly have been a lot of you know one wonderful things i mean i know that what your email what is it your email is captain kirk you have a year <laughs> so we know you know look we know yeah. that and that's true. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, Star Trek talking about Star, I mean, here's something we're this of a time gone by Star Trek is of a future that nobody has lived in yet, yeah. but very as both very aspirational programs, you know, there, I, I can still what I'm, I'm conscious of at times, you know, how the things they had to do in order to get this done and the, 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 uh, you know, where you see the creases in the paper on the view screen on the bridge of the enterprise, but the storytelling was terrific. You know, the storytelling, oh, storytelling was, was wonderful. Great. And and so here, you know, you, you're, you have, you show reverence to captain Kirk, uh, you know, boy, I mean, you're, you're not alone. You're not alone there. There, there are a lot of people who, who oh, yeah. love that. Yeah. Well, absolutely. yeah. But so and that's think, one of those shows. And we're and one of those is. shows. You they're can, one of those shows. You can forgive the uh, uh the the lack of special effects because the story is so good. Absolutely. No, no question. You just I thought that you had re you'd re uh, uh, written for uh, Tech War. Right. Yeah. No, I I did. I I had the opportunity to write an episode of Tech War. Um I was born in Canada. And so I have a Canadian birth certificate and I was very good friends with one of this, one of the writing writer producers of the program. And with the rules of Canadian content, 55% of all the content that's produced in Canada has to be done by people who can be oh, called really? Canadians. Okay. Yeah. So, so they wanted and they did a lot of uh, Canadian directors. They wanted to have an American director for an episode. Uh, one of the executive producers wanted to direct. He was American. They needed to swap that director, that Canadian director for yep. to do that. They needed to swap a, a, an, a Canadian writer or an American writer for a Canadian writer. And I became, you know, my friend knew that I'd been born in Canada. So she said, come in and pitch you know, come in and pitch us an idea. And so I went in and, and pitched an idea that was sort of out of the headlines and they bought it because they were predisposed to buy it. And it was a wonderful process of cracking this story really fast. And I was up around the clock writing this. I was extensively rewritten. I mean, you know, as one would expect to be, but I, you know, I got the credit, um, obviously i had a contract i was paid it did all that i had this wonderful experience of doing this and uh it, it was great great fun to be involved on that level you know i and that was during the time when i was really starting to move towards was sort of very early in that period as i was starting to move to the other side of the camera and realized that came to the conclusion that as much fun as I that I as I had as an actor, and I had a lot of fun as an actor. You get a lot of credit, you know, when when you're an actor and something that's good. You also get a lot of unfair blame. That's right. An actor when you're <laughs> it goes both that's ways. Not good, but yeah, it does cut both ways. But the people I think who really have the most fun are the people who are behind the camera, the the producers, the directors, the writers who are who are fully immersed in the process from the beginning of the seed of an idea. And they are taking that through to whatever it is that it becomes out on the other end that ends up getting aired. The actors are the last ones hired in the process and generally the first ones done in the process because right. the production, the actual production is really the shortest phase. It's also the most expensive phase, which is so it's you want it to be the shortest phase. Right. You need it to be because you're spending so much money during that time. 
but it's really a very short window in the in the whole process. Yeah. Now, you know, you're there, you're you're there forever. If and if it's something good, you are always there. And I certainly have had that experience with Little House of once I came in in season six, I'm there and I'm there throughout that. And you know, I, I did the episodes and loved them. But it was much more satisfying in a way mentally and emotionally to be involved in making more documentary content about right. the series, you know, making DVD bonus content where I got to decide what this content was, where I got to tell the story. I wasn't doing it alone. It is fun. It's a lot of fun. Now, maybe this is one of the reasons your, your son's your son likes to do the editing of your, because he's getting, look, you've done the conversation, but he's getting to make some decisions. Well, he, yeah, about, he's got control. And I think he does like that. Yeah. I, I think there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of high in that. Yeah. There's a rush in being in control of the outcome. Um, you know, now look, you're giving him a stream of, of, audio and video and okay, he's going to pull up, he's going to put breaks in it. He's going to do those, whatever the, whatever he's going to do to it. There's not a huge amount that he's doing to it, but he is in control. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, he doesn't have to do a ton. Most of the time. Most of the time. Right. I mean, you, and you don't want to in this situation, say something dramatic or comedic that's being shot, you know, you're dealing with all the shots, all the angles, the ability to edit, to pull up, to shape a performance you know, the, the, the editors in drama and in co and really in comedy, I mean, the performances, yes, the performances happen on the stage, but the performance is, is really crafted right. in the editing room. And, like uh, you know, when someone's really funny or when someone really, you know, rips your heart out emotionally into that's an editor that's, you know, an editor and a composer that are making those moments come together in this very powerful way. All the pieces have to be there. No question. Right. You know, someone has to have given it to you, but shaping that into this precise finished product is in the hands of someone else. And, and I think that, you know, that's exciting stuff when you're that person in our day, you know, that's a person with a movieola and a razor blade and right. tape and, they are cutting that film, literally <laughs> cutting that film and taping it together. Yeah, it was a little to more complicated back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, today, you know, with nonlinear editing, non-destructive editing, you can do, you know, you can do, you know, 20 cuts in 10 seconds. Right. You wouldn't do that with a razor blade. But no, that's right. You, know, you, you have all this and you can go, you can undo, undo, undo if you don't like it. In those days, if you were going to undo it, you had to hang on to that little trim and put it back. And put it back, yeah. Yeah. So it was it, when you made a cut in that era, it was very well considered. It had to be well considered because if you didn't end up liking it, there was a lot to put it back and start right. over. Yeah. I had read, I, I probably knew this at one time and forgotten. Now, I'm assuming you talk about it in uh, Prairie Man, but you were Melissa's first kiss. I, you I know, had forgotten that, that. Well, that's one of, I think that's part of the lore of all of this is that um, certainly her first public romantic kiss. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, I'm, I, I've come to the place, Michael, where I know that you know, maybe, maybe there was another young man that may have been somebody else. There in there. Maybe, a, a, you know, a, a kiss behind the little house somewhere with a member of our cast. You know, uh, I, I'm not going to say who, but I have the sense that maybe that happened. But for Melissa, the first romantic kiss of her career that happened on camera was, you know, was the kiss that we did together in Sweet Sixteen. Um, it was a uh, it was a special day punctuated uh, punctuated by Melissa's mother, who was crying off camera as as this was happening and, and blew four takes before we could actually get it uh, to a final kiss that could be edited and used in the program. Um, but, yeah, that was a special moment. I you know, I think Melissa at 15 years old 
and I'm, you know, I was, I'm eight years older than she was. So I was 23 at the time I'd had some life experience I'd done forever. So I'd been, you know, I had kissed on camera. I, that was, you know, that was not a, that was not something that was an overwhelming thing to me at that point. Um, for her as America's sweetheart, as someone that America adored, this was a big, this was a big yeah. moment for her. She and she was very, very brave about it. I, I don't think this was her. It was not her favorite day, but she did it. You know, she did what she had to do. And uh, we've talked about it through the years as much as it was, you know, maybe not ideal for a whole range of reasons. But people loved that kiss. And and it it changed the trajectory of the series. And, you know, Laura was. Laura had done lots of little, little kisses on camera with Johnny Johnson. And, you know, there had been other little kisses, but this was the first intentional romantic kiss with a man that she believed she was in love with. And so, you know, that made it a big deal. And, you know, once that kiss happened, we were, you know, we were heading for the altar. There was, there was, there was no doubt that this was going to, this would pay off. You know, there was, there was no turning back with Almanzo. Yeah. Of course, your, your character had some problems after that. And <laughs> he had some issues. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, you know, we, there, the, the road to the, the road to, I do could never be a totally smooth one. That wouldn't have been very interesting. That's right. That's right. That wouldn't have, yeah. that wouldn't have been good. There, there had to be some uh, missteps and hiccups and mistakes and, you know, all of that. But, uh, you know, basically once that first kiss happened, you know, the audience knew and the audience who had read the books knew that Laura and Almanzo got married, that this was a, this was we one was of those rom romances. <laughs> yeah. You knew it was going to be there. So Michael had to keep, make it interesting, but you knew it was going to, was you know, you knew it was going to go, to <laughs> go the distance. So, yeah. When does, uh, when does Prairie Man come out? Prairie Man becomes available on June 25th. It's available for pre-order now on Amazon and at Barnes and Noble. Um, but it, yes, it, it will be available on June 25th. And it will, you know, those who have bought it, pre-ordered it, will get it in the mail, I think on the 25th or certainly shortly thereafter. Uh, I just finished recording the audio book last- Oh yeah, that's on, not easy. On Tuesday, um, you know, this last Tuesday. So- that will be, I think they will drop that, you know, right in the same zone of time, I would think, but you know, that's up to them. I, I don't know when they're going to drop it, but I, it could be, you know, it could be <laughs> soon. Yeah. I had a lot of fun doing that again, you know, coming all the way back to the beginning of this conversation, the, the opportunity to be heard is, is really important. So getting a chance to, to read this book that, I sat down and wrote over a seven month period in 2023, starting January 10th, 2023 wow. in the, you know, at, in, in the pre-dawn hours, sitting down <laughs> at my, at my dining room table with a hot cup of coffee and my laptop computer and starting Amazing. with, you know, with chapter one. And and moving through this, it was I mean, really, seven months is not that long a time to write a book. No, it's not, it's not. Um, but the goal was. To have it available in the summer of 2024, yeah. in the middle of the of the 50th anniversary year of Little House, so you know the publisher said, as long as you give us a year with it, you can turn it in. You can write it. If you write it in a year, it just won't come out for a year. If right. you can write, so it's just like publishing. Once they have it in their hand hands, is a is a slower moving process. There are a lot of eyes to dot and T's to cross. I and, like making a film. Yeah, right. Exactly. And so the, you know, there are, there's a lot of due diligence that has to be done to get something ready to be actually released. Well, and, I'm glad you got it done book. quick. I, you know, I, I had been ashamed I, to come out in year 51. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. No, it, it had to come out this year. And that was one of the driving, you know, that was one of the driving metrics in this. And when I started thinking about writing the book in 2022, you know, and I had conversations with some of my castmates who had written books and they just said, they all said, give yourself time to do this because it's not going to just, it's not going to just pour out of you. That's right. And they, and they were right, but no, I, I, I had a little more 
umph on it perhaps than that because I knew I wanted it to come out in June or July of this year. So I had I had to you work. put some pressure I, on yourself. I did. I did. And yeah. I need deadlines. I, I am <laughs> if if there's a chance to procrastinate, Michael, I will procrastinate. I got that and problem procrastinate too. and procrastinate. Yeah. So I, I had to eliminate that as an option. It had to get done. Well, sir, thank you for taking some you got to come back. There's so much more I want to talk to you about. You got to well, do this listen, we can we can do that. I mean, just yeah, just invite me and uh I'll, and and we'll do I'll, that I'll, I'll holler at harlan we'll get we'll okay get <laughs> okay okay come back and be too opinionated about you know about something oh i give you some stuff we'll, we'll okay. pick a topic and we'll just all right go. and we'll go for it all right very good i'd like that um before i let you go sir so so the book is coming out uh, next month um you know, where can we find out a, more about the book and where can we find you on social media? So, all right. So again, you can, the book is, you can pre-order it, pre-order it at Amazon and at Barnes and Noble and Kensington Publishers is, book publishers is the publisher. Um, my, my social media presence is at official Dean Butler and that's on Facebook at Instagram and at TikTok. And in the weeks leading up to the actual publication, there will be a lot of social done uh, about this book. That's and then, fun. you know, I'll be doing appearances all over the country. Our, our Little House cast is out and about this summer a lot because of the 50th anniversary. So I'll be in a lot of different places. And you can check out on Facebook. You can search for uh, Little House cast events. Uh, Gravel Road Productions is the promoter of a lot of our appearances. So they there are some. I love that the cast is us. still getting together. Oh, it's we do. Years. We have a we have a good time together. It's a it's a nice group that travels together. We're a very amicable group. I think we create a nice experience for fans to who, who come out and see us. It's it's a really good thing. We're all so blessed by this, Michael. It's we are incredibly blessed to be a part of something that is so loved and that that bonds us together it's bigger than any of us you know it's we are a part of something that is a you know it's a cultural treasure it and, really is uh, yeah and and we get to be it we all got to be a part of that in different ways and it's we are all very blessed by it yeah well thank you so much sir you you have to come back have okay <laughs> you have you just have to invite me i will i will all okay right, hold on one second great. I am such a fan of Dean Butler. Just, he's unbelievable. You know, you can tell that he has been um, in show business for decades because he is just the best person to talk to. I mean, he was terrific off camera. He was terrific on camera. I could have talked to him all evening. Um, shame on me for maybe not pacing as well as I should. It uh, it went by so fast that hour. Um, hope you enjoyed it. You know, he was I'm going to have to bring him back. I've got so much more. I didn't even touch on Gidget. And if I had, what I would have said was that, you know, I mentioned when we got cable TV 1978, um, it was basically just a better picture in TBS. That was cable. You got one extra channel, but the picture was a little better. Well, TBS showed the flying nun, Gidget, uh, with Sally Field. Showed, showed both of those and eventually went into the new Gidget, which is what uh, Dean was on. He played uh, Jeff or uh, Moondoggy, I think was the uh, the nickname of, of the character. Uh, but loved him in that. I, th I thought he was so good uh, in that. You know, Dean, he was very, he was on Little House, but he easily, and he probably was, could have been in the uh, uh, kind of the Teen Beat magazines, you know, the the heartthrob back then. You know, we had um, Sean Cassidy and Leif Garrett and and some of those that were on that. I, Dean, he's a good looking guy. He could have totally done that and probably did. You know, uh, what was it? Uh, Tiger Beat 17, I think, was one of those magazines. I, Dean would have would have fit right in with that. Um, he showed up on a lot of shows that I loved growing up. He uh, my dad's favorite show, or one of his favorite shows, was Jag. He made an appearance on there. Um, Diagnosis, Murder, Murder, She Wrote. We talked about a hotel, Love Boat, Fantasy Island. Uh, those, of course, he was Hank Summers um, on Buffy. Um, let's see, Who's the Boss? Chips. I can't believe I didn't mention that he was on uh, Chips. He was just terrific on that. Um, and then, of course, the 
the new book is Prairie Man, My Little House Life and Beyond. Um, go and check this book out. One, uh, We talked a little about it, but one of the great things about Little House on the Prairie is the fact that there's so many of us still connected with it. And and that that says a lot about how good a show it was and how good a cast it was. That cast is still really close. You know, if if you enjoyed this interview, check out our interview with uh, Allison. She uh, uh, talks about playing Nellie and the good and the bad with that. But she absolutely loved her time on Little House as well. Um, so, yeah, please check that out and check Dean's book out, Prairie Man which still to me sounds like a, a superhero, but I'm going to work on that. Maybe me and Dean could turn that into the comic book adaption of Prairie Man is a little different from the book. It's it's going to be more of a superhero story. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, the book is out June the 25th. Make sure that you get that pre-ordered. You won't uh, regret it. And I'll say uh, the Little House cast, uh, they... They are all over the uh, the country for conventions and festivals and all of that. If you're in a situation where you can get to one, I, I guarantee you'll enjoy it. So please do that. We'll bring Dean back. Wanted to ask him if he'd ever read any of the books. You know, part of the reason I watched the show originally back in the 70s was because I had read some of the books and was a fan. So I was going to ask him. I, I was... If I remember right, it was my cousin that uh, was the actual fan, and she, and she had loaned those books to me, and, and I became a fan. It's really good. Thank you guys for tuning in again this week. Definitely don't take you for granted. We appreciate you so much. Um, our website is MeisterCon.com. You can find, we're closing in on 800 episodes. You can find all of those, audio and video on the website it'll let you know if we're doing anything in studio if we're going to a convention like a little house convention if we're um if we're going on location it'll it'll tell you that as well so you can find all that out website meistercon.com so definitely check us out there um imdb recently named us the top 100 podcast 15 million podcasts out there to be on anybody's top 100 list. Just amazing. So you can check us out there. And our YouTube channel is MeisterCon Pod. If you go there, please subscribe. It's free. Those subscriptions really do help us out. But all of that will be on the uh, uh, YouTube channel, MeisterCon Pod. Thank you guys so, so much. Till next time. Bye, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm once again here to ask for your support. It's been a big year for the Two Opinionated Podcast. Back in February, we got to live out a dream, moderate for William Shatner here in our hometown. In May, we passed 100,000 downloads on our YouTube channel, and we followed that up in June with 50,000 downloads on the audio side. We recently posted our 600th episode, which is pretty good volume for just a uh, father and son operation. You know, not too many podcasts can keep that volume up. We've been doing this now for four and a half years, 600 plus episodes. We recently hit 1,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel, which is a really big deal for us because we've always gotten the views, but have struggled to get people to subscribe. So that 1,000 was a big deal for us. And best of all, we were recently named one of the top podcasts on IMDb, which is the entertainment database. You know, those that are ahead of us, we came in at number 82. Those that are ahead of us are bigger companies like Disney, mostly Marvel, and Joe Rogan, that type of uh, podcast. So for us, being just a, a small West Virginia father and son podcast to be in the top 100 out of 15 million, it's a pretty big deal for us. So thank you for everything you've done for us so far. Got a couple little ways, though, that you can help us, and they're free, and they're really easy. If you haven't checked out our YouTube channel yet, please go to YouTube. It's under MeisterCon Pod. Just hit subscribe. It's free. doesn't cost you anything. really helps us a ton. And maybe even more important, if you could go to IMDB, IMDB.com, 
look up the Two Opinionated Podcast and just look around the page. Just having that traffic on the page really helps us out. So that's a couple of easy ways that you can support us, even if you're not listening or watching all of the time. And we want you to listen and watch because I think that our our guest list I would put up against anybody, any other show, podcast, anybody out there. I think our guest list holds up. So please check us out. You you probably will find somebody that you like, or maybe somebody that you didn't know you liked, but kind of discovered them on there. There's tons of that. If you're into music, we have that too. If you like books, we've got authors on there. If you if you're more into what goes on behind the scenes in the entertainment world, you know, we've got producers, directors, um, video artists, anything you can think of that happens behind the scenes, we've had them on the show. So definitely check us out. Thank you guys so, so much. Until next time. Bye, everybody.